All right, everybody, welcome back to a uh, second episode this week with our guest, Adam Levy, and I'm joined here with Joe Gore. And I'm really stoked about talking to our friend, Adam Levy. And uh, today was a topic, Joe, that you suggested um, when we were kind of brainstorming about this. And that was kind of, you know, as an independent artist, which Adam is, uh, what's his approach to kind of the DIY uh, side of getting yourself out there and making a career out of piecing together a bunch of different different guitar related aspects and music related things. Yeah, so it was a bit of a strange suggestion on my part cuz here on Chasing Frets we more often focus on the you know the nuts and bolts of playing and fingers on frets. Um but um it occurred to me because uh Adam does such a beautiful job with with all of his marketing. And maybe marketing isn't the right word because um he sends out so much stuff that's that's useful he has a fantastic newsletter. He has a popular YouTube feature called Guitar Tips. And um, he's, he's just done a beautiful job of reminding the world that he ex- exists and has much to share without being obnoxious. You know, everything he sends out is, is lovely and, and of, of value to the recipient. So I, I just wanted to talk about how he handled that, uh, you know, DIY marketing and, and uh, sustaining a career. Yeah, and there was one thing he said in this episode that's more of a give than an ask. You know, make it more of a give than an ask when you, when whether it's putting out a record or a new book or something. Um, and I think that was kind of a, that's a point that really stuck with me in this interview. And even you know, and there are several other things in this episode that even if you know, for my local band or anybody's local band, you can there's little nuggets that you can kind of. Uh, pick out and his kind of latest venture in this is that he has this really great patreon that's kind of an extension of those guitar tips uh that are on youtube his his youtube channel um that i would highly recommend so we're gonna dig into it now and here's our next episode with adam adam one thing i've really been in awe of um you know as i watch your career is you seem to be a really master, you seem to be quite a master of, um, uh, when I say master of self-promotion, that sounds like a big egomaniac thing. But for playing, you know, for playing non-commercial music, you know, you know, often not on a record label, you're a completely DIY musician who's making everything happen on your own. You've really made extraordinary use of uh, not just social media in the sense of you post to social media, but making special events, mailing lists. You have a program called Guitar Tips, which is a, a, a paid subscription, but there's also a free version. And, um, you know, I see you in my mailbox and that you're always doing something cool, but it's not just hypey stuff. It's like, here's some information you can use, or here's a fascinating concert I'm playing. And um, the range and variety and value for you know, potential fans or people who receive this mail is, is really remarkable. It just puts, you know, it just makes you seem really active and positive and interesting. And, um, I've admired your skill at that a lot. Well, thanks. Thank you. Um, gosh, well, I, one thing is that I've just always enjoyed being hands on with all the various things that I'm doing. Um, I remember, as I'm sure you do, making flyers, you know, going to Kinko's like back when, before even there was really a whole lot of email or any kind of social media. Uh, I loved to make, to design flyers. And, you know, I'd go to Kinko's in the middle of the night and, and make these cards and send them out to my mailing list back when, you know, you'd send out physical uh, mail like that. and. And I loved it. I, I mean, I th- always think back to that time. Now people are opening up their their email inboxes, but I try to to send something that would feel like getting a postcard, you know, and and how that feels m- more than um, just more spammy stuff. So that's one thing is that in the back of my mind, that's always the impact that I'm, that I'm trying to have is like, it should feel like you're, you're giving something even, even though, you know, it's show business 
at the core of it, it's really an ask. Please come to my show. Uh, please buy my new record. Please subscribe to my uh, Patreon thing. But I always try to have it feel like you're 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 giving something because I remember what it's like to receive something like that, and I just always try to put myself in the in the shoes of of the person on the other end. Um, so, you know, it started by making flyers at Kinkos, and then a little bit later when I started making my own records. Yeah, I had to figure out how to talk about my records when I was releasing music. Again, that's like, well, there's a real, I don't know. It's just, you have to, everybody has to find their own sweet spot. I, I don't think that there's a, a universal uh, sweet spot between the giving something and asking something. You have, you have to find what that is for yourself. But the, I think the best way is to, to put yourself in other people's shoes and think about what it's like uh, to, to open your inbox and read something or uh, look, at a, look at a post now on social media. So I, I've always just liked, I mean, there was a point, even when I was building my own website, I learned HTML coding. This was kind of back in the early days. Um, now I just use Squarespace or something like everybody else. But but I really loved kind of getting into the nitty gritty of it and thinking of trying to be creative at all points along the way and trying to be generous at, at all points along the way. Has there been a time where you've come up with a marketing idea or marketing a project, whether that is an album or Patreon, and you were a bit surprised about the uh it exceeded your expectations let's say yeah okay so before i started doing uh the patreon thing i was doing guitar tips on youtube joe mentioned there's like a free thing and then there's also the the subscription yeah guitar tips it started maybe five years ago i was doing uh weekly posts on youtube i had had it in my mind that i wanted to basically have like a excuse me, like um, an audio magazine. And I thought maybe I would do some interviews with people and some lessons. And it, the project in my mind started to get really big. And I thought, you know what, it's so big that it's just going to collapse under the weight of, you know, me trying to make something that felt like a magazine. So I thought, I'm just going to do one thing, which is I'm going to do a weekly post on YouTube. And sometimes it'll be a real hands-on, hey, everybody, pick up your guitar, play this thing. We're going to talk about chord voicings or improvisation. And other times, it's just philosophical things about, um, you know, I have a post there that's just, go, you know, it talks about just going outside, the importance of actually putting your guitar down and going and getting some fresh air and remembering that you're the human being on the planet and not just stuck in the practice room. So there's just kind of think pieces and there's some theory-ish stuff. And then I started doing some guest tips where I would interview people or just have them, sub, you know, friends of mine would submit things. And I, I didn't monetize it. It was never intended to be that. It was just more like, here's some real practical stuff, inspirational stuff, things to keep you coming back to the guitar and, and, and feeling good about what you're working on and, and moving forward. Eventually, it hit me that maybe I could do a paid version of that uh, because what surprised me to to Jason's questions, like, was there a thing that surprised me, is that I would run into random people around L.A. and they would say, oh, you, you guitar tips. And, like, they might know the song. Like, I, I invented this little, I wrote this little theme song that started the show. And... I started to see that some of them were really popular and it kind of surprised me because I, in my mind, the things that would be popular on YouTube would be, let me show you, you know, th think of some famous rock song. It's like, Hey, you're playing it wrong. Let me show you the right way to play this classic rock song that everybody's playing wrong or things that were like really deep dives on some theoretical concept. Hey, I'm going to do this 12 part thing where we're going to talk about Dorian from every angle and you're really going to get it. Or I don't know. I look, and then there's just people who are personalities on, on YouTube. And 
you know, the I'm kind of an anti-personality personality, I guess. So I was surprised when um, some of the, some, you know, some of the posts, you know, 10,000 people like 20,000 people like they're not necessarily the posts that I thought would be the most popular. Cause I'm, I'm not somebody who's watching the, the statistics that much. It really, they're just, I just wanted to share things and that's really all it was about. So it surprised me that it really took off. Um, and there may be another example, Jason, to like what things have surprised me, but it just comes to mind when I look at certain, certain episodes that have tons of views, I'm kind of like, wow, that's really interesting to me. I too, I was a weekly subscriber, watched it all the time. And uh, two of my favorite ones that stuck out to me was you did at least one episode on Ted Green. Yeah. Uh, and then the one where you had a, just a stack of your favorite guitar books. Yeah. Those to me, because it's like, wow, okay, well, if I get these books, I'll sound just like Adam. <laughs> um, well, you might. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it was great for me to talk about Ted Green, because I feel like he's somewhat misunderstood in the kind of way if you've only read Ted Green's books, then you're, that's one side of him. But I actually got to know him a little bit through studying with him. So I really wanted to share stuff that I think doesn't come across so quickly in his books. So that's why I wanted to talk about Ted on YouTube. And then, yeah, just with guitar books, like I've gotten so much of what I do just from there might just be one page in a particular book. You know, it might be a 90 page book and maybe there's just one page that uh, I've just worn out and I keep going back to. That's that's what I found is like not every guitar book, it's pretty rare for me to start on page one and go front to back and take it as a course. I really am always looking for that one page and that that changes over time. You know, my, Miles Okazaki's book, the Fundamentals of Guitar, um, every six months I have a favorite new page that I, I had, didn't even notice before. It's almost like the, the fundamentals of guitar fairies come in the middle of the night and sneak a new page in there that wasn't there before. Yeah. It was, it was fun having him on the podcast just simply for me to ask him questions. I've always wanted to ask about, Hey, on this page, what do we break this down a little bit more so I can understand it better. That was my selfish way of getting him on the podcast. <laughs> Yeah, and so and something something I picked up from when we did the podcast too is in our previous episode with Adam, you were talking about the exercises of um, taking a semi-random set of numbers and using it to build chord voicings and develop that through through the tunes, and I think there was a kinship with how he creates is that you know his his signature project is a massive, you know, you know, five or six CD collection of every known composition by Thelonious Monk. And, um, you know, when he plays them, he's not just like blowing through the changes. There is a, you know, he's digging deep inside the composition and finding, you know, you know, a couple of, you know, nuggets or themes and, and developing them. And the way that you described using these, you know, randomly generated intervals mm -hmm. to explore and experiment in voicings um, seemed seemed of the same uh, cut from the same cloth as as some of uh, his working habits. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I would say so. Uh, that's one reason I like that book is is that his just approach to generating ideas. Yeah, really resonated, really resonated with me. Yeah. So back on the marketing thing, Adam, you mentioned you, you, you have a page. So you had this free kind of version on YouTube. Yeah. Then at what point did you decide to expand a little bit and move over to like a Patreon site? It was about uh, two or three years ago. And it was really just as an experiment. I had already done, I don't know, well over 120 videos on YouTube. Uh, so like two years of weekly episodes. And... I just thought, I mean, and this is how I operate a lot. Like I, I, I appreciate uh, getting to talk about this with you guys, but I, I definitely don't feel like, um, like I'm a marketing guru. I definitely don't want to write a book on how to market yourself. Cause for me, so much of what I do 
you know, I roll dice to practice on the guitar and a lot of the choices that I make, even with regard to marketing is like, let's try this, you know, <laughs> let's just try this. So I didn't know when I, you know, if, if you tell people, Hey, there's 120 something free things over here, but then now I'm going to start creating this other thing where you have to pay. Uh, I very much thought, well, this could totally tank because human nature is, well, why would I pay money for those things when there's all these other free things over here? And I think that's a fundamental error <laughs> in my own way of, of thinking about it in presuming that people would think that way. I mean, for one thing, uh, people tend to be more invested when they are invested. You know, if you've got something like a streaming audio service and you can listen to all music all the time, you may not listen to the same record five or 10 times in a row, but if you've bought it off of Bandcamp or if you have some kind of hard copy um, and you've paid cash money for it, you're gonna go back to it because you're, in, you're invested, you're literally invested in it. So when I started doing things on, on Patreon, I wasn't sure how it would go. My friend Mason Stoops, I don't know if you've had him on, on He's an incredible guitar player and a friend, and, and we've played a lot of music in LA in the last few years. He really encouraged me to try Patreon, even though it wasn't something he was doing, but he was like, look, you're, these lessons have value. Just frame it that way, you know, like this is something valuable. And I started doing it. And very quickly, uh, people got into it and got excited about it. And what I do find is that people... I get more engaged. I get a lot more back and forth uh, with questions. People, um, I'll post something on Patreon and people people there will ask questions about it and there'll be a lot more dialogue. So it becomes more dynamic. That's been my experience. I know on some <clears throat> YouTube pages, there's a lot of that as well. But I found a lot of kind of um, lurkers on YouTube. Somebody will just ask Somebody who I've never heard of will ask a question, I'll answer it. I never hear from them again. They're just kind of lurking. Whereas, uh, yeah, on Patreon, it feels more like, hey, you're in, we're all in this uh, little universe together. So let's, let's talk about stuff. Yeah. And that's, oh, go ahead, Joe. Oh, I was just going to say that in raising this question, you know, I'm not trying to, trying to stereotype as the self promo guy, but, you know, for those of us who, you know, aren't, massive rock stars you know we all know a lot of people who are very very gifted musicians who yeah. haven't found great financial success or acclaim i shouldn't yeah. lump you in with that because you have you know you have written your co-written pop songs that people listening to this know and yeah. played you know guitar solos on records that people already know so you've <laughs> you've definitely um experienced the big time but yeah. for so many of us we you know if we're not signed if we don't have the fans if mm. you know if we don't look like a pop star is supposed to look. It's, it's very, very easy for us to, you know, to be self-defeating. And yeah. um, just the way that you approach that with so much ingenuity and, and goodwill, um, I think a lot of people could learn from that. Well, thanks. Yeah. I mean, it really, uh, <laughs> I've, yeah, I've been really fortunate and I'm, I'm able to, you know, when I, when I do, create something, a, a course or uh, anything that I'm doing, a show, I can always tag on things like that. Like, you know, you've heard me on Nora Jones records or Tracy Chapman records, things like that. Um, and it helps. It really does help. But I, I find that over time, um, people are discovering me who maybe don't have those frames of reference. And it's kind of on me to, to to talk to people in both ways, to people who know me from some favorite record from 10 or 15 years ago, who saw me play in their town, you know, on tour with Nora Jones or something. And then other people who maybe have just heard me for the first time this week through something I posted on Instagram or whatever. Um, it's a really different kind of conversation uh, I think than it was when I first started. When I first started, having those calling cards was really, really important. Um, uh, you know, I think about like somebody like Charlie Hunter, who I'm. Sh have you guys had him on? He he's on a list. Okay, you know, there was a time when he was on Blue Note Records, and 
um, you know, but there's plenty of people now who maybe don't remember when he was on Blue Note Records, you know, younger players who know him maybe through Instagram or something like that. Or, you know, I know that there's people who probably the first time they ever heard me play is because I played on a Wolfpack track a couple of years ago. And that's cool. I mean, it's a challenge, not like it's such a, a challenge, like it's burdensome, but just it's an interesting time that we live in that, now there's a whole generation of people that may only know my work or Charlie's work or any, you know anybody who's been doing it for a little while like we have. Not so much through major label stuff that they did in the era of major labels, but maybe more so um, because of, yeah, some something that they found on the internet, you know? And I think that's really cool. And so it's it's like we, we the self-marketing artist people, have to kind of learn different uh, dialects and different ways to uh, to connect with people because it's not just it's not just one way but it's many ways. I want to wrap up this uh, this episode, Adam, with a question that I unabashedly stole from Corey Wong mm-hmm. that he asked on his his podcast and and he asked this to Joe Satriani and that's where I kind of first kind of started to wrap my mind around this, that as you were mentioned, you know, we were come from back in the days we were making flyers and then it kind of progressed the email and then the early days of social media. And now we have Instagram is that knowing what you know, now, if you were a young guitar player trying to get the word out about what you do, yeah, what would you do? How would you do that? Hmm. A young guitar player now in 2020, if you were knowing what you know, now you yeah. were today, trying to get the word out about you and you had not played on all those Nora Jones records, yeah. the Tracy Chapman stuff. Yeah. What do you think, what would you do to get the word out? Mm. Yeah. Uh, I would do the, really those two things. Um, one is I would cultivate a mailing list, which is old fashioned, but I still think it's it's a powerful tool to be able to send, to, to kind of find your tribe, whether it's 500 people or 50,000 people and be able to talk with them directly because no matter how savvy you are at social media, there's always the, the algorithms and stuff that you post no matter how many followers you have, there'll be stuff that they just don't see for whatever reason, because Instagram's trying to show them some other stuff or whatever. So cultivate a mailing list. Uh, It's old fashioned, but it really, really is, is the way to connect with your tribe. So that would be the one thing. And then, you know, look at any of the other stuff. I say Instagram could be name your social media, of, of choice. Remember that, um, we'll we'll be generous. Like I said before, like make it a give, not an ask and have it just be what it is in a way. It's a commercial. It's not the thing. It's the commercial for the thing. And if you think about commercials that you love, um, yeah, think about your favorite commercials that that you just can't forget um, and, and just make posts that feel like that, you know, it doesn't have to be the thing. It's more like a commercial for the thing. That's a good way to, to wrap it for today, Adam. Thank you so much for sharing all your marketing wisdom. Yeah. So we'll be back later this week for our final episode with Adam Levy. Yeah.